Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I want to discuss aging in America today, and I want to introduce you to the Radical Age Movement. It's a national effort to bring a new interpretation to the longer lives we're living. Alice Fisher, formerly the Director of Community Outreach for State Senator Liz Kruger, and Steve Burkhart, professor at Hunter College's Silverman School of Social Work, are my guests today. Welcome. Thank you. It's Thank great you. to be here. You know, it's great to have you, and I love this discussion. Bill Maher said that ageism is the last acceptable prejudice in America. Is that what he said? Yes. And yes. when you think about that, it's so true, right? Right, absolutely. So, Alice, tell us about this and how it all came about. I was working in Senator Kruger's office. One of the hats that I wore, of the many, <laughs> And you're was, a social worker. I am a social worker. With a master's degree. With a master's degree. And I, my, so one of the hats that I wore to be, was to be the government liaison to everybody over 65 in our district, which was huge. It's, it's All right. I also, my specialty was housing. So housing and older adults was an explosive issue to start with. But it was everything. It was problems with health care, problems with transportation, problems with getting the food, the right foods that they needed. Just a myriad of things. And after a couple of years, I started to wonder. Excuse me for a minute. It's also a mix of incomes. It's the, oh, it, the totally. east side of Manhattan. Oh, yeah. It's a yeah. huge range. Right. So people think, oh, well, there's no poor, right. struggling old people Real, here. Uh, living there. Uh-uh. Right. Because the side streets on the east side, first of all, are packed in all those walk-ups. Mm. Also, you don't know who is living next door to you that is really struggling and really barely getting by. All right? So you don't see that. But after 2008, some of that couldn't be hidden anymore because people lost so much money in the Depression so that their subsidiary income disappeared and all they were left with was their social security, which you cannot live on in Manhattan mm -hmm. and have a real quality of life. So every day I would help people with some of the most horrific problems and started to think, why? Why do all these people have these almost intractable issues going on? And my community organizing mind always came back to age prejudice. This is just prejudice against the old people. And that's, that's where it started. I went to a, a focus group on aging, and a man who was probably, I'm 72, he was, we were, it was a number of years ago, so we, say we were in our late 60s, and he told a story about going into a bar with a friend in the late afternoon in Manhattan, having a couple of drinks and talking, and then Work ended. It was five o'clock, and all these young people came into the bar, and he disappeared. He could not get the bartender's attention. And when he finally did, the bartender said, Hey, you old man, what do you want? Mm. And he said, I wanted to jump over the counter and deck him. And we had this whole discussion on why and all of that. But he said later in the conversation, I don't understand how you can change a whole culture. And my knee-jerk reaction was, with a movement, it's the only way we ever have changed anything cultural in this country. Racism, sexism, Racism, homophobia. Homophobia, everything. So my next step was to go to Steve and have a conversation about whether this was a viable idea. And he's also has a doctorate in social work, right. but you're a community organizer. Right. And you teach it? I teach it, and uh, you can't teach it if you don't live it. So Alice came in the door with a couple of other people and sat down and began to explain exactly what she said. Well, um, I've had a number of students come and talk about the activities they're involved in, the movements they'd like to uh, either build or a part of. What happened was that very day, um, I was riding the train, <laughs> and a very nice young Latino man got up and offered me his seat, <laughs> and I wanted to kill him. <laughs> and so and you were shocked, I thought, wait right? a second, why do I want to kill him? He's being polite. And of course, as Alice explained it, I realized that, of course, it was my own internal ageism, my own fear of what it means to be perceived as old that led me to say, I have to become involved in this movement. So <laughs> we've been involved in this now for a couple of years. 
And as you said, Ronnie, one of the things about this is, you know, as Bill Maher said, we call this the powder puff-ism because it doesn't have the kind of violence that you see directed at people of color. It doesn't have the kind of violence that you see that's happened towards LGBT folks or towards women. Um, it happens like a powder puff where there's just a little brief, ah, if you call somebody ageist, they go, oh, puff, puff. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. And it disappears. Is, is this because we're, we're living longer? And, That's part and historically, of it. what are we doing here? You know, because we, the older people become a lot of them. And right. that's the problem, mm -hmm. is right. to differentiate, mm -hmm. right? Because people age differently. Right. It's not, what are we doing here? It's them saying to us, no, that's what, what I are meant. you doing No, here. that's what I meant, All that right? people are looking at us. Right. I mean, internally, as Steve would think, I'm not old. Right. What are you doing? I mean, Why how are you, you offering me a seat? Right. Why don't you offer it to him exactly. or her or yeah. whoever? Yeah. So it, 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 it's a very serious problem because, first of all, we're losing a lot. Oh, right. yeah. Well, if you, it, I mean, the, the data are real clear. If you have, um, in New York, for example, 20% of, uh, of New Yorkers uh, who are older are poor. 20% is a huge number. Um, and it, that speaks to, well, why is that? Well, as Alice said, the level, Social Security is primarily what people have. The average Social Security payment is about 1300 to $1,500 a month. Well, Whose rent is that? Um, you add in, people think, well, Medicare, Medicaid. Well, the average person in Medicare pays out of pocket five to $8,000. So you combine what they have on Social Security for the rent and what they have left over. Suddenly you find larger and larger numbers of people who are struggling, who perhaps never struggled before and now are, or when it's intensified by issues of race and class, um, find themselves deeply impoverished. So. It's a movement that whose time has come um, because, as you're saying, the numbers are much larger. Uh, at the same time, people still treat it um, like... It's uh, no big deal. It's, well, it's, you know, it is a problem, but you, we're glad you're doing something about it. Well, movements don't get built by other people doing it. They get yeah, built by do it. all of us doing it. Right. When I, it just occurred to me that rent control, the, the people who live in rent-controlled housing must be of a certain age, are they? Yes, they are, and they're all being harassed. And that's why they're also concerned about right. rent control. Oh, absolutely. And that's why it's and sort of- And rent-stabilized also rent -stabilized. are still, all rent-regulated housing is mostly occupied by older adults. And the developers and the landlords in the city have gone after them unscrupulously yeah. for anything to try to get them out of those buildings. You know, developers buy buildings that they know are filled with rent control right. tenants or rent regulated tenants with the idea that they're gonna get rid of them. Yeah. I mean, that's how they go in. So yes, that was usually for me and the work that I did in the Senator's office, that was a huge, huge issue. Mm. But there are still so many other issues. The biggest issue, by far, overall, is the workforce. It's all over. It's in everything. It's every single issue you can think of. Right. It's, it's like the women's movement. I mean, right. I always said there's a, a special, women have a special uh, interpretation of public policy right. or mm. vision of so the people who are getting a little older, right? right? Yeah. So it's, let's talk about employment. Do you remember? Maggie Kuhn and the Gray Panthers. Right, of yeah. course. And she became this militant old lady because she was objecting to the retirement age, right? 65? Right, 65. Right, right. And we thought she was and most gray haired of, yeah. and she was always described as an old gray haired woman. woman. Right. She probably wasn't as old as we thought she was. <laughs> right. so, but um, it's a major problem. It is. And getting a job. It is. You know, one of the tools that we use is right directly for me from the women's movement is consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. And um, we have one or two big consciousness raising events a year where we have people, they wind up in groups with other people they don't know just to talk about getting old and aging and Sometimes we might have a question to lead them off, but sometimes they just lead off themselves because the conversations just take their grow. Mm. And 
I mean, when we have to tell them to stop, they're like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but Steve and I have the privilege of walking around the room and eavesdropping on these conversations. And the biggest fear, the biggest fear is financial, mm -hmm. that I will run out of money before my life ends. And out of that, what happens is so many people are laid off and then when they make an attempt to get back into the workforce, they either can't get back in. There are, we have many people who've gone on job interviews who, not unlike what happens to people perceived with particular kinds of names where it's racially um, biased, uh, when people see a particular age, the bias is also applied where they don't get say, they don't get called back. And so what happens is they end up in the workforce um, as either underemployed, uh, making a third or a half of what they once did, or only being able to do part-time employment. And again, if you think about the cost of what it means to live in any particular city um, in the United States, but New York, of course, is one of the worst, they end up um, having to really struggle. I mean, the, 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 whole, the, the whole need for food stamps, the need for all the cl coupon clipping that people do, it's a necessity that people now do every single day. So, the, and, but work, you know, one of the things we're looking into about the workforce is everybody knows there's age discrimination, and yet the ability to target one particular company doing one particular you know, a really ugly form of age discrimination is extremely difficult to pin down. So it would be great if some of your listeners, if they have uh, if examples and stories of job. this, right. um, and they, it, where we could develop that consistent pattern, we know that there are people who would like to follow up with this, but getting a pattern as opposed to this pervasive smell in the air that everyone knows is there but can't quite find where its source is, is really something that we have to struggle with. That's really important. What people important. have told me is that they go to the HR, the right. human resources, and the person interviewing them, if they're lucky enough to get an interview, because right. a lot of it is Usually, done through the computer, right. uh, you don't even see the person. You just look at the right. age or the graduation right. and something like <clears throat> or that. Or what they did. It's a young person right. who, who's going to look at this older person right. who doesn't, who really, in a way, becomes very patronizing. Right. Right? Right. You talk right. down to somebody older. Right. Right. Or even if you go, you know, um, bef it was before I worked in the senator's office. It was actually before I wound up at Hunter in the social work school. Um, part of my drive was because I was out of work for two years and I was trying to figure out, well, maybe if I get an MSW, you know, that would help me get a job. And um, I had the opportunity of one of my friends was on the board of, a, of an organization that I had applied for a job for, and she got me an informational interview with the person that would have hired me had they chosen me. I never got called in even for an interview, which was most of the case. And um, I was like very excited because like he's going to have to tell me. Because you know it is illegal to mm -hmm. hire or fire somebody based on age. Mm -hmm. That's why we can't find the hard evidence. It's because it's done so covertly. Mm -hmm. And um, when I walked out of there, I knew it was my age. He did everything that you could possibly think of to talk me out of wanting this job. I won't take the salary. It's a revolving door. I'm overqualified. Every mm. buzzword that you could think of. At the end, I said, would you hire me as a consultant? He said, no problem. But he wouldn't give me a job. <laughs> It's, uh, and this recurring thing happens again and again. You said something really interesting, Ronnie, which is the whole thing about being patronized. The idea of being old, think about it, as a woman, I mean, as a woman, as a person of color, if somebody were to patronize and call you girl, um, or to call Young a man, lady. Of, Young a man lady. of color we'll boy in that. today's age, it would be perceived as mm -hmm. something, you know, understandably cause for um, you know, active resistance. If you call, when somebody calls somebody old, or what they also do is they'll call, call us young lady well, or young, young man, man, with the idea that somehow it's, there's a condescension built into that, that unfortunately, we who are old too often accept. We go, well, that's what people do. <laughs> you think so? You know, it's <laughs> a, we make light of what mm. stings and hurts, and that's on us. We have yeah. to stand, you know, um, 
we have a lot of lessons to learn from the civil rights movement. At one point in time, black was not beautiful. It was in the 50s. We know that it was a reason for people to have to fight. Mm -hmm. But the movement that was built, the power of black is beautiful, the power of black power, was to affirm who one is as opposed to feel shame. And we have a lot to learn from the civil rights movement about that. People feel ashamed to say that they're old. We could talk right. about it as mixed company. If you have mixed company where people are under 40, people between 40 and 80 are embarrassed to say their age. That was true for me. I've had to struggle with this. It's still sometimes a struggle to say, I'm proud to be 72. How many people say they're proud to be the particular age they are? I, used, I learned from my mother. I used, to, I used to tell people how old I was because they would say, oh, you don't look that age. And right. that was a compliment, right? We were joking about that. And now I, I don't even mention yeah. it anymore. But anyway, um, the, the, everything affects it, the media. When a, a, a person is attacked, a woman is mugged on the street, an elderly woman. 64. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> How do then, when you read this all the time, don't they understand? They well, it's a, the world, the, the institutions of the world, whether it's our educational institutions, our hospitals, our government, mm -hmm. doesn't realize that the demographics have changed so greatly. Mm -hmm. I looked at it as a social worker as that there's a new stage in the lifespan. That exactly. we know it's there but mm. they don't know it's there. And that is where I got myself in trouble. People mm. over the age of 60 to 85, even some 90, that are still in the workforce, et cetera, they, um, they're, they're in, in, invisible. It, you know, people are used to, okay, you're over 65, that's it. You're a senior, right. you're all the same, right. which is impossible. How can over a spread of 30 years right. we all be the same and need the same and want the same? And we still have mandatory retirement. I think the it's New York not, Times has mandatory well, retirement. Well, the judges, when I think it was yeah, Lippman yeah. was yeah. forced to step down, right. we were enraged. Like, right. how could he was right. such a great judge? How yeah. could they do that? I think Dan Rather. Right. From, I mean, somebody his age at CBS, yeah. I think also they don't. Yeah. Keep, well, there's another one. Know. Uh, Maybe I, they do because some of the guys have right. been really old. Well, he's been a great example of that you can still... Get marginalized. Yeah, but he's still out there. Yeah, he's he still working. Shrink. They expect us to shrink away mm -hmm. and right. be quiet. But when I started this, mm -hmm. I ran a program for the senator called Senator Kruger's Senior Roundtable. All right? We got, like... 30, 35 people. It was a breakfast meeting really early in the morning, so people had to be there early. But we were only, we weren't getting seniors my age. We were only getting pe the older seniors. And I couldn't think of, we tried to think of like, what are we missing? Where do they congregate? How could we get them? I changed the name from Senior Roundtable to Roundtable for Boomers and Seniors. Mm -hmm. We tripled the attendance mm -hmm. and it's stayed that way because all these people, even though they were over 65, the topics didn't change. None of them wanted to be identified mm -hmm. by the word. Boomers senior. like to be called boomers. Right. Yeah. They're that's proud. Seniors. That's younger. And that's, that's... That says you're younger than... Exactly. Than right. getting old. But also the boomers are taking care of older parents. Oh, that's yes. Absolutely. That's so another don't, wake up. Don't, do they realize they're going to be old? Well, to that group, what I said when I realized it after a few meetings, I said, okay, I know that there are people in this room that marched in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay pride movement, blah, blah, blah. And that was in the 60s. And now we're all in our 60s. And if we don't open our mouths the way we did then, now, mm -hmm. you've been taking care exactly. of your parents, yeah. we're next. Right. And that was my, that's how radical became radical age movement, right. because that's we great. were the radicals of the 60s. The radicals right. of the 60s should be involved in the radical actions now. Right, But exactly. they're not invited. So one of the things that, uh, that they're gonna have to, as Alice said, they're gonna have to fight this and not just take the part of, uh, that often now is being done. There's a lot of talk, talks, a lot of conferences on um, how to be vital when you're old, how to be, how to live fullest in your life, live your potential now no matter your age. 
all of which is wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that, except as what Alice pointed out and um, helped me understand was there were so many structural and cultural barriers that really got in the way of that vitality and that ability to, to see that um, as, a, as a possibility for all older people. We have a, every social movement's been built on both hope and frustration or anger. The hope part is I want to be vital, I want to be able to live fully in my life. We have to recognize that there's reasons that are structural and cultural to be right. frustrated and angry. Mm -hmm. These are, this idea that um, we should be embarrassed to be old or that somebody can, as you said, patronize to somebody once they admit to being a particular age or are perceived to be older. Um, and then the barriers that Alice has identified in all the areas of age discrimination at work. Um, oh, the, the other cultural area of what's perceived as beauty or attractiveness or sexuality, mm -hmm. right. it's all defined as below 30. Um, the average person, you know, I had to go to a dermatologist for a skin condition. The average person in the room to get <laughs> plastic surgery was a young woman in her late 30s and mid 40s. The fear of being old, of being perceived that wrinkles are a problem. Why is a wrinkle a problem? But of course, it's constructed that it's perceived as ugly, and from ugly, let's diminish and ignore. Right. And that's and all, yeah. does wisdom come from experience and age? Yes. And do we not have enough respect for wisdom? <laughs> Is anybody I, looking I for wisdom? I, I would say yes. Yeah. I would say we don't respect it the way. I mean, my generation, we were taught to not only respect our elders, but within our families, the, our grandparents were revered. They might not have been the greatest people in the world. It doesn't <laughs> matter. And everybody in the family revered them. And we're happy to see them and have them involved. And th that doesn't happen anymore. That doesn't and part happen of it may anymore. be older people's fault <laughs> because they believed they, they've grown up with the, the feeling that they're going to be old. And right. being old means retired right. and sort of out of all the excitement, right. Right? So, so they the don't idea, keep up with things. Absolutely. It's this idea, well, gee, maybe I should step back rather yeah. than step forward. Right. Or, well, you know, it, now it's your turn. Well, we're not against younger people having full and vital lives and being fully employed either. It's not like one should take away from yeah. a different group to be able to give to us. I mean, that's one of the, the problems that we have to confront. I mean, the New York City budget, for example, has less than 2%. Not anymore. Because we, we, he changed it. The well, budget was fixed when we first got more money. when we first looked at the budget. Yeah. For senior services, when seniors are almost twenty percent of the population of New York City, there was less than one percent. It was like point zero zero something percent of money was going to senior services, and I know we went insane. And so did a lot of other people, which forced them to put more money well, right. in. And so it, it's a little bit more. No, it is. Not it's, a lot. Oh, it is. But, it's 2%. Yeah. I mean, there's something right. to be excited about. Right. Uh, well, there's 2% that's applied. And again, it's not about we should take from children's services. No. That part of the struggle in the, or any other service, part of this is that there's a, there, there's a dance of marginality that we call it, which is that People that don't do anything, either structurally or politically, they don't add anything to the budget, and people accept very little. So they back off and say, well, thank you for the crumb. And so the crumb happens, and it goes from 0 0.1 to 2%. We go, wow, and it is. Right. It's, you know, the people who did it, Bobby Sackman and so many other people have done amazing work. So please don't hear me perceiving them as not having worked hard for what they've done. Societal-wise, this idea that 2% is acceptable for 20 just is, right. there's just something it's wrong. so overwhelming deeply. and so complicated. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking of all the different things. Uh, the, the need to lobby and legislate, the need to understand that effect. Right. But the jobs, the need for the jobs so you can contribute to the, the gross national income. Not only income. contribute, and, and how are we going to take care of ourselves if the, if the Workforce turns its right. back on and, us. And the pressure on younger people to have to help. But the, the, it's just overwhelming to me. Yeah. So we have to talk about this some more. I mean, I know. You know. There's so much to unpack. 
there it really is so much. We have to limit ourselves. Every time something new happens, yeah, oh, should we take thought. it on? No, we can't. You yeah. know, we're still building. We're a baby not-for-profit. Right. But, you know, last week there was that article from The New Yorker about the Guardian oh. system and all mm -hmm. those people in Nevada, what right. they were doing to them, just, like, grabbing them out of their homes and right. selling off their right. possessions right. and everything. Well... We well, know there's problems with the Guardian system all over the United we, States. I know firsthand from a very good friend. Right, yes. exactly. It's but it's terrifying. like, hopefully it's not as bad as in Nevada because that was a huge, mm -hmm. big case thing. But there are problems. I know. I deal, dealt with APS a lot when I was in the senator's so office. So do you, you now have a, a website? We have a website. It's www.radicalagemovement.org. Um, Facebook page. We have a Facebook page, and we're on Twitter. We're at Radical Age. Is that everything? <laughs> well, go on Radical Age, and come to our events. When they look at Facebook, when right. they look at our uh, web page, they'll see events. We are planning a social action in May, Older Americans Month. Who knew? Right. Um, but we're planning it to be in May. We haven't picked the date yet. We're still working with people. We need people to work with us to right. be able to build this the way it needs to be. Stepping back is not going to make it to be a vital, to live a vital right. and meaningful life. We have to have the hope and, we, and aspiration and we have to right. have the frustration and anger. We believe in working on both. We're looking for people who have experience in media. Almost anything. And anything. We follow it. That and just have, believe in this. Energy and, and commitment. Right. We'll commitment find something is, for them to do. Yeah. All right. Well, we I hope we continue this discussion. Yeah. Um, and I hope you'll come back again. We will. Thank you. Thank We're, you very thank much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. It's been very interesting. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.